Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 61 to 65. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 61, 62, 63, 64, and 65. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 61, we're asked which of the following correctly lists the order of opening and closing of the sodium-potassium channels in neurons. So we want to know the order that we have opening and closing of the sodium-potassium channels. And we're talking about in neurons, so we're talking about the action potential. What does it look like? Generally, the trend looks like kind of like this. If at this baseline we have resting membrane potential, Initially, so the bottom should be relatively much smaller, should look like kind of like that. Yeah, so initially we have the neuron at resting membrane potential. Then we have depolarization, which is when the action potential arrives. And then we have the neuron being depolarized to the threshold. And then after that, depolarization occurs, which is when sodium channels open first. And then we rise up until the maximum depolarized potential of the membrane and then while the membrane potential is depolarizing at the same time when we get near to the threshold at the top which is around like positive 30 millivolts that is when potassium channels begin to open so sodium channels open first then potassium channels which begin to let potassium out as sodium begins as sodium is still coming in so that we can get back to the resting membrane potential and then after the potassium channels open then the sodium channels begin to close and then finally, eventually, the sodium channels close, and then the sodium-potassium pump brings us back to the resting membrane potential. So what happens is sodium channels open, then potassium, and then sodium channels close, and then potassium. So B is the correct answer. So sodium opens, potassium opens, sodium close, and then potassium close. The rest are incorrect. In A, it's, it's implying that potassium closes before sodium closes. In C, it's saying potassium ch channels close, but that doesn't even make sense because they weren't open in the first place. In D, it's saying potassium channels close first. No, the first thing that would happen is that the sodium channels would open and we get depolarization. So we can immediately remove option D. So B is the correct order. <clears throat> in question 62, we're asked which of the following would be most likely to occur with a defect causing a leak in the right ventricle. So we have a defect in the right ventricle in the heart, you should know that the left side of the heart, left atrium, left ventricle, that's responsible for the systemic circulatory system. And then the right side is responsible for the pulmonary system. So if we have a problem with the right ventricle, we expect that there's going to be a problem with the pulmonary system. So specifically, the ventricle is responsible for pumping blood into the system. Therefore, like the pulmonary arteries would have a decreased pressure. And overall, there'd be a decreased pressure throughout the pulmonary system. So option A is saying systolic blood pressure would decrease significantly. No, this is, well, we can expect, depending on the nature of the, the defect, for systolic blood pressure to decrease. So this would be the contraction of the heart, and ventricles are responsible for this. However, there is a stronger answer. Option B is saying venous pressure would increase. No, likely it would decrease if there's, you know, less pressure available for the ventricles to contract. Option C is saying pulmonary blood pressure would decrease. This is a better answer than A. So pulmonary blood pressure we definitely know would decrease because that is what the right ventricle is responsible for. It's possible that the systolic blood pressure would also decrease, but we don't know if it would be significant enough because most of that pressure comes from the left ventricle and the left ventricle, we're assuming, is still perfectly healthy. So it's this significant part that kind of makes A an unsure answer. C is a much stronger answer. And then D is saying aortic blood pressure would decrease significantly. Once again, no, that's the right, or sorry, that's the left ventricle, not the right ventricle. <clears throat> in question 63, we're asked which of the following problems would not be expected to take place in a severe chemical burn of the skin. So you have a severe chemical burn in the skin, which would not be expected. So three of these options are expected and one is not. So for this, you need to know the functions that the skin plays as an organ. So option A is saying that there's a change in pigmentation of the skin. This is something that we do ex expect because we have 
pigment cells within our skin that are responsible for our skin color. And if we have a severe burn, then these cells are damaged and then we see a change, therefore, because these pigment cells are also not able to do their normal function. Option B is saying increased risk of infection. Yes, the skin is our first barrier against outside pathogens. So if this is damaged, then we do have an increased risk of infection. C is saying a decreased ability to thermoregulate. This is also correct because we use the skin to thermoregulate, especially like, for example, when we're sweating, that is one way in which we can cool off and, you know, thermoregulate and remove excess heat. But this is going to be changed when our sweat glands are damaged because of the severe chemical burn. And then option D is correct. It's saying decreased fluid loss to the environment. No, that is not a change that we expect because the skin actually helps us prevent fluid loss. So it helps us keep fluid inside our body and otherwise we would have too much fluid loss. But now that the skin is damaged, we expect we expect increased fluid we expect increased fluid loss to the environment. But option D is implying that we have we would have decreased fluid loss. So that's not something we would expect if there was a damage in the skin. So D is the correct answer here. In question 64, we're asked which of the following would not be would not be expected to be found in glomerular filtrate. So in the glomerular filtrate, what do we not expect? Well, the filtrate, it's taken from the glomerular capillaries into the Bowman's capsule, and there are specific pores that allow small enough substances to go through, but large substances that are supposed to stay within the blood do not. So things that are important for the blood, such as red blood cells and proteins, are supposed to remain in the blood while everything else, such as the liquid or plasma and small things like ions, are supposed to go through. So option A is correct. We do not expect to see red blood cells in the filtrate of a healthy a person with healthy nephrons and a healthy kidney. B, protons, we do expect ions to go through. We do expect, once again, ions, sodium to go through. And urea, yes, this is a major product that is, you know, excreted into the urine, into the filtrate, and then it becomes a part of the urine afterwards. So B, C, and D are definitely things which are expected to be found in the filtrate, but A is not. In question 65, it says a pulmonary embolism is a medical condition where a blood clot, typically from veins in the legs, may form, become dislodged, and ultimately make its way back, ultimately make its way and get stuck in pulmonary vasculature directly after passing through the heart, which results in pulmonary issues and sometimes death. In which of the following structures would such a clot be expected to found? So we're told that embolisms, which are blood clots, can form, for example, in a vein and then make its way back and then it gets stuck after passing through the heart. And then this results in pulmonary issues. So we're asked, where is it expected to be found? Well, if something is lodged in a part of your circulatory system after passing through the heart, that would be the arteries, right? So B is our correct answer here. It would be the pulmonary artery. It would not be a pulmonary vein because we're told that this is where it originates, but then it travels away from there because it comes dislodged from that site and makes its way back, passes through the heart, gets lodged somewhere else. And then that other place where it's lodged is a very key place in, in, as part of the, the, your circulatory system. So it's the pulmonary artery, which is the main place where blood is pumped towards the lungs. And if that is lodged, if there's something lodged there, that's going to be a major problem. So we're told, yeah, it goes after passing through the heart. That would be the artery, not the vein. Option C is saying the left atrium, but that's part of the heart. It would pass through there and go into the pulmonary arteries. And then D, aortic outflow. No, we are talking about a pulmonary embolism. So that would be in the pulmonary cir circulatory system, not the systemic one. So B is the correct answer here. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions just like this and go through all the different answer options and explain why each one is correct or incorrect so that you develop the correct logic for the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for this video. 